Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you have been with us before, you know we've been studying the life of Jesus. And we're now getting down into that last six months of his life here on earth. We've come to a place where uh, there's going to be an interesting story. Let's go to the book of John, uh, chapter 11, and we can start right at the beginning. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, and that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and when he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? This is one of the important verses to suggest that they were really trying to kill him. That's right. And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. But if in a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things he said, after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may wake him out of sleep. <laughs> Then the said to his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let's go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Oh, let us also go, that we may die with him. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, uh, the disciples were taking these threats very seriously. And right well they should. Yeah, exactly. They recognized what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were up to. And, of course, Jesus had been over across the River Jordan, on the other side of Jericho, out there somewhere, so he would have to come back, cross the River Jordan, come to Jericho, walk up that road where the Good Samaritan did his thing, all the way to Jerusalem, and then across beyond that to the city of Bethany, and where he would, you know, find Martha and Lazarus. So um, it's interesting, this kind of death, they understood. Mm -hmm. Let's go die with him. They could understand the Jews. Yeah. But this death that he said it was going to happen and then raise in three days, that got past them. Yeah. Yeah, a different story completely. Well, what happened next? What did they actually do? Well, they found out that he'd been there for four days. Well, the disciples of Jesus actually went to Bethany, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, and when they got there, Jesus, they found out that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Anything and symbolic about that or anything practical about that number? Yeah. What, what is practical about that? Let's all talk about well, that. If, he'd been raised back to, if Jesus had gotten there earlier and raised him back to life before three days was over, they might have considered it maybe a reviving, like with uh, widow of Nain's son and, and Jairus' daughter, which had probably only been dead, what, hours? Yeah, 
less than a day because yeah. they were buried yeah. within 24 yeah. hours. So, uh, but the, apparently the Sadducees had the idea, or their concept was that this is all you get. There ain't no more. But there was a essence that hovered around the body for three days. Yeah, they actually the Jews. We can trace this back as far as the third century A.D. We haven't been able to trace it back further than that. Of course, it's, it's when you get back to that point, it's hard to trace anything, yeah. even the Bible. <laughs> That's right. But uh, you go all the way back to the third century A.D., a, a tradition that said the spirit would hover around until the de body deteriorated. The, it deteriorated enough so much that the, the face was so distorted that it was unrecognizable. And then the spirit would say, well, that's, it, it, yeah. I don't recognize. going back in there. I, I, I don't recognize that thing. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. So that was a sort of theory behind this. And, and so they believed that. But even the, the Pharisees had a similar concept. Mm -hmm. But the Sadducees, no resurrection. Pharisees did believe in a resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. So this is because they had a hard time recognizing who was dead and who was alive in those that were in coma. And sometimes yeah, even today we do. Mm -hmm. you know, there, that back in, in dark ages there were, you know, people dreaded this. They would, had all sorts of coffins and so on that would have flags to raise up to warn someone, someone's alive in there. Yeah. Is that where the idea of a wake came about? Because mm -hmm. they said, man, they keep the corpse around for... Mm -hmm. In case they mm -hmm. woke up. re-energized. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So is this? Did it seems that Jesus purposefully waited yes. till the fourth day? Jesus purposely waited to the fourth day, and what happened then? Then it would be impossible to resurrect him, but yet Jesus did it. Yes. So he traveled now up there, and of course, who? What's happening on this fourth day as Jesus arrives at Bethany? Oh, all the mourners are out there. Mourners are out and friends. I mean, there's good evidence. We know that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were, were cousins or nieces and nephews or something of Simon who was a Pharisee. So they were probably Pharisees also, meaning they would be wealthy. They were, they were among the upper elite from Jerusalem. So many, many, many people would be out there, you know, mourning the death of Lazarus. And that's exactly what Jesus needed. Remember, his goal here, now in this last six months of his life, of his ministry on this earth, his last, the last six months, his goal is to get the attention of as many people as possible, get the positive attitudes of as many people as possible, so when he's crucified, they would say, hold on, why is this guy getting killed? What, what, what are we supposed to learn from here? What, what's going on here? And basically, the idea, if the truth is to be known, turn against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because obviously they were not on the right side of this issue and, and, and have people give a, 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 at least a serious thought to Christianity. So that's where we're going. Okay? Well, when Jesus arrived, I'm now reading from my Good News Bible starting with verse 17 in Matthew, I'm sorry, John 11. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been buried four days before. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Judeans had come to see Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother's death. Remember, he would have to be buried how soon? 24 hours. Within 24 hours. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. You can just hear her pouring her heart out in this statement. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask him for. Your brother will rise to life, Jesus told her. I know, she replied, that he will rise to life on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And this is the place where he makes that statement that's repeated so often. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live, even though they die. And those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Good question. Do we believe that? Yeah. Yes. Explain it then. What does it mean? What does it mean that die? you will never die? What we call the first death is described as a sleep, and Jesus yeah. had said that earlier on. But in John three sixteen, it was John three seventeen. For God that said there were. Uh, we're talking me, about who, the judgment. Yeah, but the eternal uh, yeah. who shall not perish but have every eternal life. For God sent the Son of the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe in him is condemned already. Yeah. 
but uh, it you don't. So should it, should it better read, uh, he that believeth in me might sleep a while but won't die? Mm -hmm. no, okay. Easy to understand that way. Yeah. Easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yes, Lord, she answered. I believe it. I do believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Now that's a pretty fourth, that's a pretty incredible statement at this point in history. After Martha said this, she went back to call her sister Mary privately. The teacher is here, she told her, and is asking for you. Now teacher in, in Aramaic would be, or Hebrew would be what? Rabbi. Rabbi. Yeah. Uh, when Mary heard this, she got up and hurried out to meet him. Jesus had not yet arrived in the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The people who were in the house with Mary comforting her followed her when they saw her get up and hurry out. So the whole crowd is now following the two sisters. They thought that she was going to the grave to weep there. To weep there yeah. In this whole mourning process, is this probably reach a, a peak and an apex at a certain part? It kind of builds to a crescendo and you kind of think that's what Jesus was waiting for was he knew this was about the time when it's going to really <laughs> reach this, yeah. this crescendo. And the goal here is to, one, to wait until everybody's certain that he's dead, number one, and number two, to get the attention of as many people as possible to what he's about to do. Have you, in your travels, have you ever, in different cultures, have you been, been around where this custom was, was actually an occurrence? Have you ever seen anything like this? And what's well, what it, what's it like? What specifically are you thinking about? I don't know if you ever, you, you've spent some time in Africa, for example. Well, I can tell you that in the island of Madagascar, in the highlands of the island of Madagascar, they bury people in, in special little crypts above ground. And they expect to go back there every year on the, on the anniversary of that thing. And they take the body out and they clean it up and they wash it off. I don't know exactly what kind of state it's in at that point in time, whether they do any embalming every year and then put him, and then rebury him. Uh, but I'm talking about this this mourning process oh, where oh they yeah. get together and oh yeah, yeah. In Africa, it's a very and the women have a way of mourning that you can hear for like I swear miles away, and it is. Now this I, is I, a big, yeah. big commotion. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the richer you are, the louder the sound because the more you can hire. Sure. Yeah. Do yeah. they hire these people? Sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Mary arrived where Jesus was, and as soon as she saw him, she fell at his feet. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and he saw how the people with her were weeping also. His heart was touched, and he was deeply moved. Where have you buried him, he asked them. Come and see, Lord, they answered. Jesus wept. <coughs> and now I'm sure that um, probably all of us at some time, especially as children, memorize this as one of the, the shortest verse in the Bible. Actually, it turns out that's the shortest verse in some English versions. Uh, there are two other verses which are shorter in, because in Greek, this verse is um, <coughs> Yesu. It's actually three words in, in Greek. Um, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice evermore is kairata pantata. There's only two words. And there's also uh, pray without season, ceasing, which is um, Prashukasta adialepta, adialepto. So that's only two words. But now if you count letters, if it's really important to you count letters, then... Um, I, um, Until he's got grandsons. <laughs> <laughs> if you count letters, this is kairata pan... Uh, I mean, kairata... Um, prashukasta... Now I'm mixing up here. It's... Uh, anyway... The Thessalonians one is shorter. Well, they're both... Those other two are both in Thessalonians <laughs> at five. The uh, pray without ceasing is the shortest, and then Jesus wept is the middle one, and then um, um, what's the other one here? Now I'm all I'm a blank here. I'm trying to think <laughs> back and forth between Greek and English. I'm getting myself all confused. Anyway, it's the longest. So uh, Jesus, see how much he loved him, the people said. But some of them said he gave sight to the blind man, didn't he? Could he not have kept Lazarus from dying? So you can see how the, the tension is building. Well, both of, each of the sisters independently has said, 
Jesus, if you were just here, yeah. he wouldn't have died because we know you could heal him yes. if he were still alive, but we're not so sure now. He wouldn't yeah. have had the teachable moment, though, had he just yeah. done it. Well, deeply moved once more, Jesus went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone placed at the entrance. And by the way, if you go to that part of, of Palestine, there are lots of caves, and there are quite a number of graves like this, and they will be happy to show you the one for a small fee, the mm -hmm. one where, where Lazarus, they believe, was buried, right there in Bethany. So um, Martha, the dead sister, uh, I'm sorry, take the stone away, Jesus ordered. Martha, the dead man's sister, answered, there will be a bad smell, Lord. He has been buried four days. That's a very important key text. What? Have Why? you ever heard a sermon on that text? Why did Jesus weep? You mean well, a sermon on dead people stink? Well, no, on, on why, why is that an important text? No doubt, no doubt in anybody's no mind. There is no dead. doubt no, in dead. anyone's dead. mind. Right, That's yeah. the important point. Yeah. He is dead. Yeah. No question about it. You can't come back and say, oh, he wasn't really dead. No. No, and, and nobody tried to. <laughs> so. Why did Jesus. King James say he stinketh? He yes. <laughs> why did Jesus, why did Jesus weep? What was he weeping for? Is it, was he weeping for Lazarus or was he weeping for the confusion and, and, the, and the lack of understanding on the part of the p people. There were two main things that Ellen White would suggest in his Desire of Ages he was weeping for. One, he was weeping in sympathy with the people who were weeping. But more important than that, he was weeping for the fact that he recognized that he was about to perform the biggest miracle of his ministry. He's going to raise Lazarus from, from the dead in front of probably hundreds of people. And they're all going to see it. And yet, despite all that, the Jewish leaders are not going to change their opinion. It's going to make them, especially the Sadducees, it's going to make them even angrier. And now the Pharisees have been against Jesus all this time, for, back since he first you know, cleansed the temple, way back at the beginning of his ministry, they've been opposed to him. Now and the, Pharisees, the Sadducees have sort of thought, you know, who cares? You know, this guy is just a flash in the pan. He's, you know, he's going to disappear one of these days and nobody will care about him anymore, kind of stuff. And when this happened, remember their teaching was that it's not, imp not possible for a person to be raised from the dead. When you're dead, you're dead. That was their teaching. So when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, all of a sudden he has not just the Pharisees opposed to him, but all the Sadducees are against him again. So for the, this is finally these two groups who were always at each other's throats, now both of them agree that we've got to get rid of this Jesus or he's going, to take, he's going to take the government down. He's going to take all of us down. He's going to turn everything upside down, which is exactly right. Is there a similar parallel to at the end of time? You're going to have two opposing... Yes. What, what would those opposing things be? Well, at the end of time, there's... And here we're actually talking about three. We're talking about two bad influences as opposed to one good influence. At the end of time, there will be just one good and one bad. Very opposed. Don't be uniting or teaming up. No, of, uh, no. But the same logic. Isn't it? Isn't it expedient that one man die to save the nation? Mm -hmm. That same logic will be. Shouldn't this little group be gone to save the save the world? Yeah. Well, Jesus said to her, "Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed?" They took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, I thank you, Father, that you listened to me. This is an important verse because it tells us that the power that raised Lazarus to life was God in the heaven. Father's power. Jesus didn't exercise his power any more than we could if we had the same kind of relationship with God. Because Ellen White says that that Father's power was mediated by angels. Mm -hmm. So the angels were involved in this oh, resurrection, yeah. even though it sure. doesn't say that here. Yeah. I know that you always listen to me, Jesus goes on to say, but I say this for the sake of the people here so that they will believe that you sent me. After he said this, he called out in a loud voice. Can you imagine everybody? I mean, imagine yourself standing there. They've rolled back the stone. You're looking into a dark space. A spooky space. Yeah, it's a very spooky place. Place you don't look into. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> normally was. And was, Jesus said, what? Lazarus, come out, or come forth. He came out, his hands and feet wrapped in grave clothes and with a cloth around his face. Untie him, Jesus told him, and let him go. I wonder how he got up if he was wrapped so yeah. tight, you know. Well, he was probably wrapped. Sometimes they wrapped him, the limbs independently. So mm -hmm. Maybe so. You could, they didn't have to be all, all mummified. Let him go. Let him go. Isn't there a mum, uh, isn't there a movie like that in the 30s, The Mummy Returns or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not into that kind of movie. <laughs> so Jesus has just performed this incredible miracle. It, so how, what happened? What, how ha long, well, what happened to the people? Let's think about that for a minute. How long do you suppose it was before the entire message of, of the, the message of this was across all of Jerusalem? How long do you think it would take for this kind of a message to get around? Well, how long would it take email and they didn't have instant messaging or no. so well, how long would it take them from get to walking. this place to Jerusalem yeah. about uh, half an hour that's about how long it took because they went straight to the Pharisees yeah. yeah yeah exactly but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done uh -huh. then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and, and said the chief priests were otherwise called what scoundrels the Sadducees. <laughs> the Sadducees. The Sadducees, yeah. The priests were Sadducees. What do we do? Mm -hmm. For this man doeth many miracles. Well, let me go on in this way. Everyone will believe in him. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Yeah. <laughs> That's not what they thought. And the Roman authorities will take action and destroy our temple and our nation. What are they really saying? We'll Could lose power. We'll lose our power. That's really what they're saying. The Romans had no desire to destroy the temple. The, the temple was built, a lot of it, with money from, from Rome. They didn't want to destroy the temple. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have lost their special influence, their special power over the yeah. nation. We can't let that happen. So Caiaphas said what? Ye Don't know, you know, oh, go ahead. Ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And what happened? They proceeded, what next? They proceeded to figure out how they could kill him. <laughs> well, once again, from that day on, verse 53, from that day on, the Jewish authorities made plans to kill Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus did not travel openly in Judea, but left and went to a place near the desert to a town named Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. We don't know where that is. Nobody has discovered that location. But for a long time, they'd been plotting to yeah. kill him, hadn't he? Yes. Hadn't they? Since, yes. since he had <laughs> resurrection, since healing well, on the Sabbath. Way back from the time he cleansed the temple the first time. Okay. Almost from the again? beginning of his ministry. It, yeah, it says, yeah. Yeah, back in what, John 2, I think it says something like that. Then Jesus therefore walked no more openly mm -hmm. among the Jews. Mm -hmm. So, so How where sad. does he go? Well, the time for the Passover festival was near. So this happened very close to the time of the Passover. And many people went up from the country to Jerusalem to perform the ritual of purification before the festival. If you were a really devout Jew, you arrived in Jerusalem a week in advance. And that's what Jesus did and his disciples did to that whole week to get ready for the Passover. All the rituals of purification. And it was during, we call it Passover week. It actually wasn't Passover week, that, that week, final week of Jesus' life. It was the week before Passover. He died on Passover. Yeah. So this was the time you're supposed to be getting ready. So, um, verse 56, they were looking for Jesus and these people who came and they get, as they gathered in the temple, they asked one another, what do you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? The chief priests and the Pharisees have given orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was, he must report it so that they could arrest him. If anyone even knows where Jesus is hanging out, they have to report him so they can arrest him. Wow. So what happened? What happens next? We go back to Luke. Luke chapter 
um, 17, starting with verse 11. As Jesus made his way to Jerusalem, he went along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He was going into a village when he was met by ten men suffering from a dreaded skin disease. We've already talked about the story, haven't we? They stood at a distance and shouted, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus saw them and said to them, Go and let the priests examine you. On the way they were made clean. When one of them saw that he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself to the ground at Jesus' feet and thanked him. The man was a Samaritan. So guess which gospel we're reading about that in? Luke. <laughs> has to be in Luke. Jesus spoke up. There were ten who were healed. Where are, where are the other nine? Why is this foreigner the only one who came back to give thanks to God? And Jesus said to him, Get up and go. Your faith has made you well. Okay. Did, the, did their faith of the other nine make them well? Yes. Well, Jesus made them well anyway. Presumably made them well, but here was a, a, a person who came from a different group. Um, wouldn't, I, don't, I wonder what would have happened if he had gone with the other nine to the Jewish priest to be, cared, to be declared clean. Yeah. You ever thought about that? What the, would the Jewish priest have said, get out of here, you foreigner, you cursed well, Samaritan? Would the Samaritans pay any attention to what they said anyhow? Weren't they running their own rules? Yeah. So he wouldn't go to the priest. Maybe not. Yeah. But, you know, when you're a leper, you hang out with other lepers, where they, no matter where they come from. Sure. So the implication here is that not just the Jews considered leprosy uh, oh, no. uh, something to be isolated, but the Samaritans also. Yeah. Virtually all people in ancient times. It was called the finger of God, it was the touch of God, the curse of God. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pretty bad disease. I worked with lepers for years, you know, out in Africa. It's not a, not a nice thing to have. And the thing that's so sad about it is that if people would take a few simple precautions, you could prevent it completely, or pretty much completely. Yeah. Yeah. It could be done. Real what, are, what are a couple of those precautions? Well, vitamins? Well, not necessarily vitamins, maybe. A good diet is helpful. Uh, lots of soap and water is helpful, and um, um, if you even start to get the disease and you're aware of it, you take some antibiotics, and it's easy to get rid of. Specific antibiotics. Yeah, very specific for that disease. Yeah. Well, so now we see that the time has come for Jesus and his disciples to make their final journey to Jerusalem, and we read about that really down in, in, in Luke chapter 18. Um, and I would like to specifically uh, pick up in, in verse 18, verse 31. There's some things that we need to read and then we'll take a break. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we're going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. Is that difficult to understand? who will make fun of him, is that hard to understand, insult him, can you understand that, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. This is actually, my version calls it the third time, this is actually the fourth time that Jesus has spoken about his death, why did it take them so long to figure it out? Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Jesus and his disciples are on their way from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And on that, on that way, they, Jesus calls them aside and he said, in essence, you know what's going to happen when we get up to Jerusalem. Now, when they had gone to Jerusalem just a short time before that, what this, did, this is that same road that the, 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 same that road the, the Samaritan, that was, the on. Samaritan was on. <laughs> and it's the same road that they had to travel up just a short time before that when they went to, to raise Lazarus from the dead. Mm -hmm. and, and what did Thomas say? He read for us. Let us go Let's with go him and, oh, yeah. and die with him. We'll go die with him. But they were they were thinking about the the Jews uh, killing him for this reason. The the idea that it had to do with his mission didn't get through. Why do you think God intentionally kept them from understanding this? What what does it mean when it says the meaning of the words was hidden from them and they did not know what Jesus was talking about? Was it maybe not God, but maybe the devil that confused them so they didn't understand? Is, well, is, it a, is it another way of saying they just didn't understand? I think that also, but it, it might be brought to their memory that he had mentioned it before. So finally, when the th event actually happened, it would have even a greater impact on them. This was their biases, of course, that had that kept them from understanding this. How many things are we not understanding right now that we've Boy, heard over question. and over? And Boy, you know? I wish I knew that. No. And which ones? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we've heard this many times. We're still puzzling over what that means. Yeah. Well, on his way out of, Jer out of Jericho, on his way up to Jerusalem, what did Jesus do? What, who, who, who talked to him and what happened there? Do you remember? Blind man. Okay, he healed a blind man. Uh, called out. His name was Bartimaeus. What does Bartimaeus mean? <coughs> son of Timaeus. Yeah, son of Timothy. Right. Bar, son. Uh, bar mitzvah is a son of the law. That's the ceremony that Jewish males go through at age 12 to become an official uh, male Jewish adult. Mm -hmm. um, so he called out to him and, and, and Jesus healed him. And then w walking on a little bit, Je well, Jesus went on into Jericho and was passing through. There was a chief tax collector there named Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus who was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was a little man and could not see Jesus because of the crowd. And so we all know the story. What happened? Found in a tree. Jesus, Zacchaeus rushed ahead. He says, I, I, I can't work my way up to this crowd because nobody likes me anyway. They're not going to let me ahead. They're not going to give me a giveaway to let me get in there. But if I run up ahead and climb up in this tree that I know about that hangs out over the road, at least I'll get a good look at Jesus because Jesus is going to have to walk right under this tree. New sycamore trees are big. They're huge, some of them. And um, so Hard he's to climb. Not easy to <laughs> climb, some of them. I, I don't know exactly where yeah. the lowest limbs were on this particular tree. But um, um, anyway, he was. And what happened when Jesus came along? Invited himself to dinner. <laughs> just not only dinner, but to stay the night. <coughs> yeah. He, verse 5, when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw, said to Zacchaeus, hurry down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay in your house today. Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. Now, who was staying, who was walking with Jesus besides Jesus himself? At least 12 yeah, disciples, yeah, and who yeah. knows how many other people. Right. So this is not just, well, do you have a spare cot on the floor or somewhere I can stay, put my head down. I mean, he's inviting a lot of people. All the people who saw it started grumbling. This man has gone to a, as a guest to the home of a sinner. I mean, which one of them wouldn't have liked to have had Jesus in their home? And here he's going to who? Tax collector. The tax collector. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Listen, sir, I will give half my <coughs> belongings to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times as much. Wow. Was he just a good tax collector, or was he convicted of something here? Or He was convicted. He was, and um, if, you, if we accept the, the story of Ellen White, he had listened, to, he'd heard about Jesus, 
He had heard about John, John the Baptist before. He had heard of what he had to say, and, and, and he already had tried to turn and, and reform his ways and so forth. He would even go to people and try to pay them back, and, and they, they, would, they, they would hardly even accept the money back from him. He, he found out the, the way of repentance was hard, mm. a way of trying to repair your thing. But, so Jesus had al Zacchaeus had already started this. Who wouldn't accept money? Well, the people thought that there must be some kind of a trick to this or something. You know, here, here's this tax collector giving us money back. I mean, who ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> Receive a, a check from the government and you hang on to it because you know they're going to call it back sooner or later. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what happened? Zacchaeus was, was one to the gospel, yeah. basically. Well, what happens next? Well, there's a parable in the middle here. We don't know exactly where, exactly what are the circumstances where that was said. But the important thing is Jesus approached Jerusalem and he went to Bethany. And what happened there? It was What's the first thing that happened? Go to Matthew 26. We're looking, to, looking at things chronological here, so they seems like we're jumping around a little bit. But. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had suffered from a dreaded skin disease. And what was the dreaded skin disease? Leprosy. Leprosy. So this is verse 6? This is verse 6 of Matthew 26. While Jesus was eating, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar filled with an expensive perfume, which he poured on his head. Now, when you get over to John, well, not when you get over to John, we already did John 11, and it already had mentioned, John mentions this story, right. and he, he connected it to that story, which happened before this one. The, the resurrection yeah. of Lazarus and, La yeah. and the sister exactly. Mary. But these two events happened very close to each other very close to each other. The disciples saw this and became angry. Why all this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold for a large amount and the money given to the poor. And who was the one that started that? That's Judas. That's got to be Judas. Jesus knew what they were saying, and so he said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? It is a fine and beautiful thing that she has done for me. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. What she did was to pour their, this perfume on my body to get me ready for the burial, and they should have been saying, what? What are you talking about? So now why, I... Why did she understand? Why was her she? paradigm... Why, <coughs> why would she pour on perfume that was used for burial? Well, she did, no, she didn't mention anything about burial. She, she had this perfume that probably was, was... She may have even purchased it to put on the body of Lazarus. Lazarus, yeah. And now... Lazarus is back alive. And she says, as she can see the crowd is just swelling in support of Jesus, and she figures out the next day, Jesus is going to be marching in this triumphal entry to Jerusalem, and she says, I'm going to be the first one to anoint the new king. Okay. She's not pouring this perfume on him to bury him. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the one who talks about burying him. Okay? okay? Now I assure you that wherever this gospel is preached all over the world, what she has done will be uh, told in memory of her. And, of course, we know that this is Mary that was at one time, had a bad reputation in town, mm -hmm. probably was a prostitute. Jesus had, cast, had, had done what? Cast seven, seven devils, devils, devils out of her at different times. This is not seven all at once. This is seven different times. He had cast demons out of her. And so... Um, what happened as a result of that experience? And one of the twelve disciples, the one named Judas Iscariot, and by the way, we could, we could stop for just a second. I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but who, uh, who else uh, had some words to say about this time in their mind, their, in their own thinking? Judas thought the, the money had better be spent on, on but the who poor else was, rather who else? than Jesus. Well, Simon, wasn't he? What did Simon say? Well, he was thinking if 
if he knew her background, Jesus, he wouldn't let her do this kind of stuff. If Jesus had really knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch it. Yeah. And what do how, we know? How is that? If how did I mean, he wasn't know? Simon? Wasn't Simon? Not not Simon Peter. No. No, no but wasn't Simon. this, this was wasn't this uncle. Mary's? This was her uncle. Mm -hmm. So she know. <clears throat> didn't he know that Jesus had had? Uh, was intimately connected with Mary, with the devil's thing, and other things as well. Exactly. And so how could be Mary had been a part of his entourage for <coughs> months, maybe years. So how is he? How is he making this kind of a statement? If he really well, knew what this out, woman was like. It turns out once again, if you read some extra insights <coughs> from the writings of Ellen White, she says that Simon himself had led his niece into sin. He had taken advantage of her. In a, an incestuous relationship. Her parents, as far as we know, their parents were dead. So Simon probably sort of looked after these young, these three young people and had taken advantage. She probably was a beautiful young woman and he took advantage of her when she was young. And that's probably why she left home. Because the place where, when we call her Mary Magdalene, Magdala is up in Galilee. It's not here in Bethany. But her home was here in Bethany. So she ran away from home and up to Magdala, and we don't know what all happened up there, but she ended up with seven devils, and these devils were cast out by Jesus. So there's lots of stuff going on. Jesus, Jesus is what? What does this story say about God? Okay, well, let's, let me finish it really quickly. So what happens? Jesus turns to Simon and says, let me tell you a story. Yeah. There are two people, one owed a lot of money, one owed less, a lot less, and the, the master forgave both of them. Which one do you think will love him the most? The one who forgave the most. And then Jesus said, you know, I came into your house. You're a rich man. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me any, you didn't do anything special for me. You prepared a meal, but you didn't really take care of me when I was welcome. You didn't, you know, any of those kind of things. Now this woman is not only washing my feet, she's washing, drying them with her hair, and she's, she's covering me with this expensive perfume. So who loves Jesus the most? Pretty clear, isn't it? And Simon realizes, I don't know what else Jesus said, we don't have the whole story here, but Simon realizes that Jesus knows yeah. the whole story. Yeah. Now, what does that say? What does that Jesus say about, about God? About God. <coughs> yeah. Now, remember, it's quite likely, we can't prove this, but it's quite likely that this Mary was the one who was involved back in John 8, who was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Well, it was allegedly, because there was no proof that she was No there. proof. But they were... Uh, they claimed that they had caught her in the very act. Yeah, but they didn't have Maybe the now we, to go with Now her. we know who with. Yeah, well... <laughs> No, I hope not, but possibly, yeah. So, in all these circumstances, look at how God treats them. And at that time, and this time, why didn't Jesus say, Simon, you scoundrel, let me, let everybody, let me tell everybody how you got this woman started in this sinful kind of a lifestyle. What does it say to you about God that he didn't do that? He kind of did the same thing to Simon that he did to Mary when Mary was on the ground. In other words, he was not accusing Mary. He was not, you know, judging Mary necessarily. And the same thing with Simon. He was showing him some mercy also, some well, forgiveness perhaps. The people, the real scoundrels, were the ones who brought that woman. That's right. And what did Jesus do? You know, he could have said, let me write your, sin, your sins on the wall. I mean, I can write on this granite here, you know, or this marble here. Let me write your sins up on the marble here. No, he wrote, there's, there, there, we don't know exactly what he wrote. My guess is he wrote maybe dates or places and these, because they left starting from the eldest. <laughs> <laughs> the eldest were uh, supposedly wiser and they, oh, they could see. And more sin, perhaps. We, we don't know what, what exactly, well, I mean, who knows? But clearly, you know, Jesus knew, and they knew that he knew about their experiences. It's quite possible that more than one of them had been involved with this woman. 
Okay? So, yeah. Um, in any case, you'll find more of this information if you want to look at it in our handouts that we provide for these studies, and they're all on our website, <coughs> theox.org, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So now Jesus is ready. The next <coughs> morning, there's a triumphal entry. And what happens in the triumphal entry? It's a big commotion. It's a big commotion. It is a big commotion. That for sure. And uh, gets on a gets on a, a donkey, a colt, which is uh, for centuries uh, the formal announcement that uh, you know king is yeah. a king is coming. Yes. Royalty rules the. the yes, yeah. yes. He sends the, his disciples ahead. They get it ready. He gets on this donkey, and and all the people. I mean, Mary anointed him, hoping that he's going to be the next king. Everybody who's connected with Jesus is hoping that. He, this time he's come to Jerusalem and he's got such an entourage their idea is they're going to take him to Jerusalem they're going to anoint him as king before anybody can stop them that was exactly what they had in mind and what did stop them you remember Jesus kind of stopped them how did he do that well, he got to the top of the hill and well, when you, when you travel from Bethany, you go like this and up over the Mount of Olives, and there you get to the ridge over the Mount of Olives, and you're looking at the temple across this, this, this small valley there. You're looking right across at the temple. And Jesus comes up, and here he is, and they're, they're putting down palm branches, and they're putting down their coats, and the donkey is walking across them, and Jesus is riding on this, and they're shouting, you know, hallelujah, and the scribes and the Pharisees saying, Jesus, make these people stop. Make them stop, because they... They realize it's, just, it's not very far to Jerusalem. If he gets to Jerusalem, they're going to anoint him. And they're going to say, we have a king. And so they're saying, make him stop, make him stop, make him stop. And what does Jesus do? If they d he says that if they stop, what would happen? The, the, stones, stones, would would cry cry stones, would the stones themselves would cry out. But then he gets to the edge of the, the, the hill there. And what does he do? Cries over the city. He wept. He stopped and he just, and it says this is not a humble, you know, quiet little, uh, you know, thing. Jesus just pours out his heart because he realizes that he's within a few days of being crucified by these people and these are the people who are supposed to be his people. I mean, and what do you do? I mean, what else could he have done? Just just really sad. So he wasn't crying for himself. He was crying for the them, the people, his children. Yep. Yep. Crying for his children. I wonder what he'd do if he came up over the hill today. Yeah. What would he say about the church? Our church? The Christian church? All The whole world? What would he say about Muslims? What would he say about Hindus? What would he say about atheists? Well, so the triumphal entry, the people, you know, they couldn't believe. Here he is weeping. And what happened? They weren't sure what to do. They didn't know how to console him. They didn't, they didn't understand why he was weeping. They just sort of melted away. And what did Jesus do? He went across the valley before people sort of realized what was going on. He sort of melted into the crowd himself, and he and his <coughs> disciples walked across. And he went to the temple, spent a little time there, and before they could arrest him or anything else like that, he went out probably to the Garden of Gethsemane or possibly back to Bethany to spend the night. That was kind of a bust of a parade. Yeah. How far uh, from Bethany to the, to the temple? Oh, two miles, maybe. Less, maybe. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So we're now into Passover week. And what happens? In Passover week, well, don't everyone speak at one time? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus has two days. It, it turns out. Just let's let's, let's look at the, the the sequence very very briefly. Jesus spends Monday and we've already talked about Sunday. He spends Monday and Tuesday in the temple. We'll, we'll focus on those. 
Wednesday, he probably spent mostly in prayer. We don't know what happened those days, that day, Wednesday. <coughs> Thursday, he and his disciples get ready for celebrating the Passover in the upper room. And then, of course, Friday, he's crucified. And, and the, the Passover cer ceremony start at that point. So let's, let's, let's go to, to Matthew 21, and we'll see what happens next. Jesus, I'm looking at Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus went to, into the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. Now, was this the first time that Jesus had done this? No. When did he do it before? The beginning of his ministry. Back at the beginning of his ministry. And if you read Desire of Ages, it's very interesting what she says about this. She says, that the Pharisees say, you know, after Jesus had driven them out of the temple, they went and they said, why were we running? There was only one of him. There's a whole bunch of us. What were we running from? <coughs> we're never going to let, we're going to make sure that never happens again. They probably wrote an SOP to make sure it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, what happened? By the way, the first cleansing was in John 2. Yeah, in John 2. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stools of those who sold pigeons and said to them, It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a hideout for thieves. Now, that's interesting too. What's a hideout for thieves? A den. Uh, what does that mean? That's not the place where the theft takes place. No, it's where, where they, they live. Hang out. <laughs> it's the place where they hang out. It's the place where they bring all their Treasure gatherings and, and their treasures and they divide them up among themselves. Interesting that she, he should call it that, right? The blind and the crippled came to him in the temple and he healed them. So was, did everybody run? No. No. They didn't see any reason to run. The children didn't see any reason to run. The chief priests and the teachers of the law became angry when they saw the wonderful things he was doing and the children shouting in the temple, Praise to God, to David's son. See, and what were they doing? They were running. <laughs> running away. So they asked Jesus, Do you hear what they're saying? Indeed I do answer Jesus, Haven't you ever read this scripture? You have trained children and babies to offer perfect praise. Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. So, there we go. The next morning, what happens? And he's on his way into the temple, yeah. very early in the morning. Hungry. He's hungry. And what does he see? A fig tree. He sees a fig tree, that's a right. A fig tree. Yeah. And what, do you, what did he see in the fig tree? Leaves. Which means? There should be figs. Should there should be figs there. <clears throat> that's right. And what did he find? No leaves. <laughs> Nothing but leaves. And what does that tell you? <clears throat> Something wrong with this fig tree, right? A lot of display and no fruit. And Jesus said, what? He cursed the fig tree. And just to jump over a period of time, the next day when he came back, what, what, did, what did they see? Withered. The tree, tree was, was completely gone. dead. What, was what does that fig tree represent? Yeah, and why was Jesus cursing it? He didn't do anything wrong, did it? Well, Christians today would probably say that represented um, the, the Jewish nation at the time. Why would they say that? They had a form, but no func they were not functioning. Very, very pretentious pretentiously pious, pious people. Okay, pretentiously pious people. What does this act tell us about God? Well, Jesus is saying that pretentious piety, Ellen White puts it in these words, she says, pretentious piety is nauseating to the Lord. <laughs> and you know where she says those words? Those words? Mm. Any idea? What's she talking about? He's talking about the Laodicean church. And who does that include? You and me. Us. Yeah. Us. Pretentious piety is nauseating 
to the Lord. Well, it that says in Revelation, uh, in Medic, like yeah. in Medic, it would. Uh, yeah, right there in, in, in Revelation 3, talking about Laodicea. Yeah. Well, that's not me. Not you. Okay. That's, you can be an exception. That's other people. So the point is, we, we need to produce some fruit. Yes. We need to do something. Yes. Yeah. How do you do that? What, what, do you, what do you start working on to accomplish that? Ourself first. Mm -hmm. I think the, only, the, the only thing you can do is go get acquainted with Jesus. Yeah. Well, by beholding we become changed. Right. Great Conversy 555 and many other places. But basically, God is saying to you, look, if you want to be prepared for the final events of this earth's history, you've got to have a relationship with me. And that relationship has to be so good that you understand much of what's in the scripture. You, you've asked yourself, okay, what does this say to me about God? You've thought it through. You understand why Jesus had to die. You understand what he's doing now in the heavenly sanctuary, etc. And when you understand all those things, what happens? It changes you. It changes the whole... If you give the Holy Spirit that kind of time to work on your head, it makes a difference. It changes you. Yeah. And what's the result? Well, if you do it long enough, it gets you prepared for the kingdom of God. So we're, 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 and Jesus is going to spend the next day, which we'll talk about next week. Jesus is going to spend the next day in the temple speaking directly. Here's a crowd watching him. They want to be close as they can to him because they want their, their, their sick people to be healed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And meanwhile, he's being attacked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're taking turns, trying, trying to do anything they possibly can to trap Jesus in some way to get some kind of words that they can use against him. And the Pharisees take a turn first, then the Sadducees take a turn first, and then another turn, and then some other people. They try to send some people in that they think Jesus doesn't know to try to trick him and so forth. So that's where we'll pick up the story next time. Their final attempts to, to and, and they just, Jesus just every, so obviously just turns the tables on them every time, and they're left just making fools out of themselves. And I certainly hope that doesn't happen to us or to you. See you next week.